Grace and peace be yours from God our Sovereign and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. In my time with you, I have been challenging you to think theologically. I've been encouraging you to be the theologians that God has called and equipped you to become. In the Living the Question class, we are attempting to see what a 21st century faith in God might look like. Part of that effort is found in learning to read the scriptures from a historical and metaphorical perspective instead of from a, from a literal perspective. Another part of thinking theologically is knowing what lies behind some of the traditions and the assumptions of scripture. Today's lesson are a case in point. Behind Paul's admonition to his readers lies a tradition that we refer to as the Deuteronomic tradition. It comes out of the community of Israel after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 597 and the Babylonian exile. It is tied to the people of God trying to figure out what went wrong with their relationship with God that resulted in not only the loss of the line of David but also in the destruction not only of Jerusalem but also of the temple, the most sacred site in Jerusalem. <coughs> what was so terribly wrong that all of this came to a screeching halt and the people of God deported back to Babylon? As they reflected on their history, Part of their answer to that question of what went wrong is, well, we must have failed somehow. And because we failed to live up to the high calling that God calls us to, God is withdrawing his favor from us. Even more than that, God is punishing us. Now, that may not seem like good news to you, but in the ancient Near East, when one nation was defeated by another nation, that also meant that that nation's God that defeated you was more powerful than your God. And so part of the response to the fall to Babylonia was the religious community saying, it's not that the Babylonian God is mightier than our God. That's not the case. What is going on here is God, Yahweh, the God of Israel and Judah, that God is allowing Babylon to overtake us, to punish us, because we have been unfaithful. And in that punishment, God is driving us down on our knees so that we will repent so that we will remember so that we will return to the Lord our God and there you have that beautiful phrase that comes out of the prophets return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love so on the one hand the Deuteronomists are saying what has befallen us historically is indeed the doing of our God. It is God's punishment upon us because we have failed to live according to God's will. 
So that was the Deuteronomist primary point of view that any ill that befell a people was a result somehow of God's displeasure. So that if one was sick, one must have obviously displeased God and therefore were experiencing this illness. If one was poor, one obviously was not living in God's favor and therefore you were poor. And as this theology developed in one began to shun those who were sick and those who were poor because they represented sinners with whom God was displeased. And when floods and earthquakes and fires and wars took place, they were all attributed to God, bringing about God's judgment upon the people for an unfaithful response. That is how the holiness code came into being. So that those who were sick or poor or considered unclean were considered to be sinful and being punished by God. And holy people avoided sinful people. And so Gentiles were avoided by Jews. You see this line of thinking in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah who oversee the return of the exiles to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple. Ezra and Nehemiah say to those who have returned from the Babylonian exile, get rid of your foreign wives. Divorce them. Drive them out of the country. They are sinful. They are the reason why we failed in the first place. Because according to the history, when we take, took control of the land of Cana, the land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants, according to the historians, God said, kill all the inhabitants. So that they won't be there to tempt you. So that they won't lead you astray. And we didn't do that. Instead, we married with them, we adopted them into our community, we opened our arms to them, and gradually, slowly but surely, we have been contaminated by their influence. And that contamination has led to our sinfulness and our sinfulness to our downfall and so on. Now that's not the only view in Scripture. That is one view of Scripture. And there is indeed within the Hebrew writings some very strong witnesses against such a view. Such as the story of Jonah who you remember, is swallowed up in the belly of a whale because he, he didn't want to go preach to those Ninevites. The whole story of Jonah is about saying to the people of Israel, Ninevites are okay. Even though they are Gentiles. So Jonah is a counterpoint to the Deuteronomic historians. Similarly, you have the book of Job. Who Job is a righteous man. We're told that right up front. A righteous man. And he suffers all of these calamities. And his friends come to him one after the other. Saying, Job, surely you have done something to displease God. And Job is saying, no. And they said, yes, Job, you have done something to displease God. That whole story is told to be a counterpoint to that Deuteronomic historian point of view that sinfulness or that calamities are a result of your sinfulness. 
which was clearly not the case with Job. Well, in today's epistle lesson and gospel lesson, you have these two points of views contrasted to each other. The Apostle Paul, reflecting the Deuteronomic point of view, lifts up all of those tragedies that happened to the children of Israel out in the wilderness and how they all displeased God and they were all struck down. As if God were punishing them for their sinfulness. And in the Gospel, you have Jesus' response to that Deuteronomic point of view. Do you think all of those Galileans that were killed by Pilate, when he mixed all of their blood with the blood of the sacrifices in the temple, do you think all of those Galileans, that, that they were the most sinful people around? No. Or when the Tower of Siloam fell and killed those people, do you think they were the most sinful people around? No. In other words, the calamities that befell them were not a response to their sinfulness or lack of sinfulness. It was circumstances that happened. 